Hello, good morning and welcome to Daybreak on Trust TV. It is Monday and it's absolutely amazing right here in the nation's capital. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. And I'm Darshan Hussein Usman. Thank you so much for joining us this beautiful morning. Yes, uh, today promises to be great. Today promises to be a blessing to each and every one of us. In fact, this week, uh, the weekend was full of activities. You know, uh, the Colonel governorship debates, you know, has come and gone. And uh, thank God for, you know, a successful one, by the way. We can't wait for the next one. But then, you know, the show continues. The show must go on. And we'll start with the highlights at this hour. All right, Jigawa State Governor names new Emir of Duty. 228.1 billion Naira budget. Sarap Suze Lowen, Bajabi Amila over NAS spending. 2023 Davis Cup, Great Britain reached finals as Cameron Nori seals victory. Now let's take a look at the details of these stories. Governor Mohammed Badaru Abubakar has approved the appointment of Mohammed Hamim as the new Emir of Duse. He succeeded uh, he succeeds Nuhu Mohammed Sanusi, who died in an Abuja hospital last week. A statement from the Emirate Council said the name of the new Emir was forwarded to Jigawa State Council of Chiefs, which also approved the decision of the Kingmakers, but sent names of the other two contestants to Governor to the governor for his approval. Now, Duse Emirate Kingmakers had unanimously selected the new emir from among the three contenders for the royal seat. The Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, has filed a lawsuit against the Senate President Ahmed Lawan and Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Gwajek Biamila, over the new National Assembly budget. SERAP Deputy Director Kolawale Oluwadari disclosed this in a statement on Sunday, saying the suit became necessary following their failure to cut the unlawful National Assembly budget of 228.1 billion naira, including the 30.17 billion naira severance payments and inauguration costs for members. In the suit, defendants are President Mohamed Buhari, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abu Bakr Malimi, and the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed. He stated that the suit followed the move by the National Assembly to increase its 2023 budget from 169 billion proposed by President Muhammadu Buhari to 228.1 billion naira. While the approved budget shows an increase of about 59.1 billion naira, the country's budget of 21.83 trillion naira is based on a 10.4 trillion naira revenue and an 11.34 trillion naira deficit. The rights group wants an order restraining and stopping Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, from releasing to the National Assembly the budget of 228.1 billion naira until an impact assessment of the spending on access to public goods and services and the country's debt crisis is carried out. All right, and finally, Cameron Norrie has sealed Great Britain's place in the Davis Cup Finals group stage as his victory over Colombia's Nicolas Major gave the Vistas an unsaleable 3-1 lead in Bogota. The British number one made it back-to-back -back straight set wins at altitude on clay as he beat Major 6-4-6-4. It meant Dan Davis was not required to play a final winner-takes-all rubber against Nicolas Barrientos. And with that, we wrap up highlights at this hour and move on to more stories. All right, let's take a look at some news reports of this hour. Civil society organizations and human rights groups condemn in strong terms the killings of over 80 farmers and herders in Katsina communities by bandits on Thursday. Now, this was announced by the chairman of the Coalition of Civil Society Organizations in Katsina in an interview with Trust TV over the increasing spate of killings of innocent people. Abdullah Yamadi completes the story. The groups said the inaction of security operatives to provide reinforcement to the villagers when the bandits took over eight hours carrying out the killings could have saved innocent lives. There are military base in Kankara. There is military base in Malumpashi. There is military base in Rongodia. There is military base in Huntua. And none of these places is more than 25 kilometers away from where that incident happened. And uh, this happened in a very long period of time. Some say more than three hours, four hours, this thing had been happening. 
but there is no enforcement from the security men. Bakori and Kankara communities are suffering from bandit attacks over the last seven years, with thousands of lives lost, properties worth hundreds of millions damaged, rustling thousands of domestic animals and payment of millions of naira as ransom to the terrorists over the years have devastated the local communities. What we need from the government is action. The government need to do everything humanly possible to ensure that this problem has been brought to an end. The issue of banditry, the issue of kidnapping and all form of insurgency should be stopped. The rights groups and civil society organizations are also worried over the number of orphans and widows the bandits offensive would leave behind. If we go back and understand that it is the governor or the government of Kazakhstan that said you should protect yourself. These people are here to protect their own properties and themselves, but they end off into this. Like what Chairman said is, what about the securities, the agencies that are around that place? Are those people not indigenous and citizens of Kazakhstan that state that they are supposed to be protected? Look at the democratic and the election and the electioneering activities that is going on now in Katsina State without even giving concern, much concern, on the issue of this killings. The groups called on the federal government to secure the state and make frantic efforts to resettle the families of over 84 people killed by the terrorists recently. Abdullahi Ismayamadi, Post Television News, Katsina. Well, it's um, uh, really a sad one, and uh, we actually hope that, um, you know, uh, the spate of killing of innocent people reduces uh, drastically, you know, uh, very, very soon. Let's move on to more stories. Nigeria's Federal Road Safety Corps has appealed to the nation's parliament to fast-track all legislative processes for the establishment of training and degree awarding institutions for the Corps to achieve its mandate of carbon road accidents. Now, this was made known during a public hearing in the nation's capital, Abuja, on four bills before the House of Representatives seeking to establish training institutions for personnel and the public. The report. It is a stakeholders gathering organized by the House of Representatives to consider four key legislations that seek to create institutions for training of personnel of the nation's safety corps. The corps, with a capacity of about 77,000 personnel and 30,000 volunteer corps marshals, the bills, the bills lawmakers said will also make an institution that will award degrees and train non-personnel. It is worthy to note that Nigeria, that for Nigeria to achieve the objectives of the above mentioned United Nations conventions, other laws and regulations, training and retraining of members of the Corps is of utmost importance. It is my firm belief that the establishment of the institutions would avail officers and marshals of the Corps and interested members of the public opportunity for capacity building and the development of positive policies that will eradicate the menace of road traffic crashes in the country. It will also enhance leadership qualities of, of such members of the Corps to be vibrant, to be vibrant road traffic administrators and safety managers. Emphasizing the need for training and retraining of personnel to eradicate road crashes, safety managers present during the public hearing called for the harmonization of the four bills to fast track its legislative process. The first one is a, a bill for and that to establish the Federal Road Safety Commission Command and Staff College, Ibada, to serve as a high level center for training of Federal Road Safety Corps personnel, personnel of other sister agencies, relevant ministries, departments, agencies, the bill for and that to establish the Federal Road Safety Commission Academy as a degree awarding institution to provide academic and professional training and for related matters. After a critical review of the bees, we, 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 we came to the conclusion in the Federal Road Safety for the harmonization 
of uh, these four bees. That instead of having four bees and then creating follows, it will be too cumbersome and unwieldy. So we felt that uh, we want to recommend that uh, they should be harmonized into one single bee. Stakeholders, however, said provided legal backing and recognition for the learning institutions of the Federal Road, Federal Road Safety Corps at various levels will assist Nigeria to achieve the objectives of the United Nations Conventions on Road Safety Management. And with just three weeks until the presidential election, Benue youth are worried that the rising cost of transportation in the country may affect voters' turnout. Now, Jimmy Azandi, who spoke to some Nigerians in that state, says there's an air of apprehension in some quarters due to fears of disenfranchisement caused by the cost of transportation. Let's take a look. The streets in some areas of Makudi and Benue as a whole are becoming empty even in highly populated areas due to the rising cost of transportation. Both intra and intercity shuttles have become nearly impossible for most residents of Benue State. While some are resorting to walking, others cannot due to health challenges. Today, people tend to actually take advantage of situations, most especially in the business world. Because if you look at, yes, no doubt about the fact that the price of fuel today is high and at some point even to get it has become a problem. But then you discover that people in the business world um, tend to make, take advantage of this situation. The residents added that if something is not done fast, the hike in transportation would affect the 2023 post negatively. They said, coupled with other challenges, most people cannot afford to travel out to participate in the elections even when they are willing. High cost of price to transport themselves back to their various places like students from Inugu, Benin, Delta, who are in Benue State cannot afford such amount to travel back to their states for the general election. And as well, students who are indigenous of Benue State and who are in other states studying cannot afford such amounts to travel back to the state for the general elections. They urge the authorities to intervene and swiftly too to reduce the hardship on Nigeria. The price of petrol is the cost of the high prices in transportation and of such if the government can please bring down the price of petrol. Like right now in some states a pe petrol is sold, is sold at 350 naira per liter, some 600 per liter. If this is not done, I am telling you, the population that would participate in the election will be like, would, it will be a disgrace. The population will be low. I am pleading with the government officials to please intervene. There has been tears of agony in the past weeks due to the Naira crisis and the fuel hike who just said have made the situation worse. They are hopeful that the situation does not lead to voter apathy in the coming polls. Well, Nigerians seem to be going through a lot this season. Uh, let's move on to more stories. Prices of grains in Adama have gone down owing to the scarcity of Naira in the hands of buyers and traders. Now, with this development, weekly markets in the state are wearing empty looks with low turnout of would-be buyers. Silas Loang visits some weekly markets and files in this report. It is not the usual busy market day for these traders as most of the market activities are at standstill due to non-availability of cash to transact business. Traders here are just counting losses almost on daily basis. A bag of maize that was sold between 20 and 22,000 naira last three weeks is now selling between 17,000 and 14,000 naira or even 12,000 naira depending on the transactions, transfer, cash of old or new currency. While some are not happy with the development, calling quick review of the policy. Others say it is a welcome development. When we talk of the cashless policy, actually it affects us much. In the sense that when you go to remote area, when you have no cash, nobody will go for, will give you his own goods. So as a result of that, you will just come out with nothing. Because they are not accepting 
uh, transfer. And uh, most of the remote areas, not just they are not accepting it, they have no network. When where you even find network, the network is not very, very bad. I used to buy rice, soya beans and other grains with millions of naira before. But with this new policy, I hardly buy goods because of lack of cash. Our business requires cash. We are in serious trouble. For me, this policy is good, and it will never come at a better time than now. May Allah bless President Buhari for implementing the policy. We are now buying foodstuff at lower price. Transporters also have their own side of story as regard to challenges and new wave of hardship caused by the CBN Naira redesign and cashless policy. Passengers are not going to be able to get the changes that are going to be able to get the changes that are going to be able to get the changes that are going to be able to transfer. This policy has brought actually nothing to us but on cold hardship. We don't like it. Our businesses are on standstill. If really they want our votes and peace of this country to continue, let them review the policy. Passengers who make a transfer, they get to make them money so basu carbon transfer say cash. To gas kia wana change in kudinda akamana change in magiri ni. They said we have to be cashless society. What have they put in place to achieve that? Some passengers will come here and suggest making transfer, but the network is not there. If you go to ATM for withdrawals, long queues, fuel stations, queues, I don't understand. Although Central Bank of Nigeria said the redesigned denominations of 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira notes a new limit on the large withdrawals is aimed at Corbin Money Landry, observers say the timing and still talking Naira redesign as Gombe residents battle scarcity of the redesigned notes. The Central Bank of Nigeria has met senior officials of commercial banks operating in the state. Speaking to newsmen, CBN Deputy Director of Financial Markets Aliyu Ashiru said the meeting with commercial banks is to ensure smooth circulation of the newly redesigned Naira notes across the state. Um, if you recall, uh, I think there has been some uh, changes to the guidelines of the implementation of the uh, policy. Uh, there is now an OTC transaction, OTC, I mean, over the counter payment of 20,000 Naira. Mm. So it's these modifications that we have called them, discussed with them, let them understand uh, the uh, process and then how it works. Uh, basically, uh, there is a ratio that we advise them to follow for all the cash that they have collected, uh, a ratio of uh, 40, 30, 30. 40% for payment through their agents, 30% for payment over the counter, and 30% to be loaded onto their ATM machine. Uh, we've come here so that uh, we will like, give the bank money, at least let, you know, uh, uh, let them not you know, stay over the weekend without having cash in their ATMs, one. And then secondly, we want them to pay the first customer at 8 a.m. tomorrow, uh, sorry, Monday when they open their businesses. Are there mm. sanctions for to any bank over these new directives? Oh, okay. Would there be sanctions? Uh, would there mm. be sanctions? Okay. Yeah. And natural, would we, uh, naturally, there are sanctions and they come in many ways for any bank that flouts, you know, the content of the guidelines that you have given. Senator representing Borno South, Ali Ndume, said the scarcity of the new redesigned Naira is affecting the fight against insurgency in the Northeast. Now, the chairman, Senate Committee on Army, at a chat with journalists in his residence, revealed that the situation has caused more hardship across the country and forced frontline troops to struggle to feed as well as affecting logistics in military operations. Now, he stressed that the Central Bank of Nigeria should make the new notes available to avoid widespread protests that could be similar to the NSAS protests.
As it is now, they are finding it very difficult to access cash, especially the new notes. So the uh, CBN Bank uh, cashless uh, policy and, uh, and uh, the new uh, Naira design is affecting the security operations negatively, and it should be considered before it gets out of hand. I am aware of one situation or two uh, that the military or uh, personnel that normally take short hours passes to come to ATM to uh, get money. One, they come to the ATM, the money is not there. Number two, there is queue, a long queue. People sleep on, uh, at the ATM, and when they try to jump the queue, there, has, there was a problem that uh, one soldier was mobbed and nearly killed. Even this cashless policy that they are talking about, they are trying to circumvent a problem instead of facing the problem frontally. I am a, I'm, I'm, I'm worried and concerned about the policy saying, bring in your old money into the bank. And then you cannot take the money out. It's not going out. Nobody is asking anybody, where did you get the money that you are bringing in? Now to election matters where the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, is confident that whatever challenges experienced during the mock accreditation with the bimodal voter accreditation system machines will be fixed before the elections. Now, INEC National Commissioner in charge of Kaduna, the FCT, Nasarawa and Plateau States, Mohamed Haruna, gave the assurance at the Rigachukum polling unit in Kaduna. The mock accreditation exercise at Tidumwada Regachkum polling unit 13 recorded attendance of few voters. Idris Al Hassan was the first to be accredited. He described the process as less cumbersome and hoped it would be maintained during the election. I came early. I'm the first person that has been accredited. Actually, very, very, very easier to accredit everybody that came. INEC, electoral officers in charge of Igabi local government area, Fatima Garba, noted that if the tempo of the accreditation is sustained, large number of voters can be accredited within a short time. So if, this, if we keep up at this pace, we hope that even if with the large number of registrants that were expected during the uh, elections, with the way the um, uh, machine, of course, operated today, with what we what, with what we are, with what was witnessed today, we are hopeful that if we go at this pace, uh, we will be able to accredit as many voters as possible. One issue that came up during the mock accreditation exercise in this polling unit was the refusal of the Beavers machine to accredit one of an identical twins because of the facial features. Uh, but but there's enough time, three weeks, so we'll be able to sort it out. And as you can see, it's very, as uh, the admin, the, uh, admin, admin sex said here, it's very it's isolated. Though that have been done here, only one had that. And even that they were able to do it because they used the facial when they couldn't use the, you know, the fingerprint when they could. If what is witnessed here at the mock accreditation is anything to go by, the process is by far an improvement on the card reader. However, many hope no hitch would be recorded during the elections. Yalla Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. Well, in the end, we hope for a free, fair and credible elections. We'll take a quick breather and when we return, it'll be time for the newspaper review. Stick around. Now, as part of efforts to support Africa's goal of strengthening... Now, looking at the activity chart, as you can see right here, a total volume of more than 30... There is a six Boko Haram crisis that at that time was restricted to Yobe. How secure are they? You can see security men with blood. This is the road leading up to the... For Libya, if you look at England squad, you are looking at EPL, you are looking at their names. You are not looking at...
TV. Documenting the Nigerian story. It's still daybreak on Trust a TV. We're live in the federal capital territory. Now let's take a look at what the papers are saying this morning. We'll begin with Daily Trust newspaper. And the lead story here says bandits attack. Seven to one buried in Katsena communities. And writers here says more still missing. 27 women kidnapped. We're left on our own, says locals. Buhari Atiku condemn attack. And uh, you can find details of that story on page four. But then there's an infograph of the particular story talking about the total people buried, uh, the women kidnapped, affected communities in Bakuri local government uh, area, uh, ranging from uh, Jarab Jag Jagaba, Gidangado, Gidangago, and uh, a host of other communities. Now let's take a look at uh, more stories uh, from the top there. PDP, APC, a bicker over Tinubu struggles for democracy. Airlines blocked funds. Travel agents fret over $500 million revenue, 721,000 job losses. Cancer kills 700,000 Africans every year, says WHO. You can find details of that story on page 7. Now more stories. Badaro appoints Sunusi as new emir of Duse. Naira crisis, reps may be convened before elections, says Bajabi Amila. Details on page 5. Six killed, property raised as gunmen attack owned old villages, and one injured as thugs attack Adama, governor's wife's convoy. These are some of the stories on Daily Trust newspaper. Next, we'll take a look at the Punch newspaper this morning, and the major story reads, Buhari under pressure to end fuel Naira disasters. And Ryder said it says governors in talks with presidency may fill it as reps mal emergency session. President must intervene. Crisis affecting turnout at rallies, says senators and reps. And still looking at the front page towards the top. Um, interim government illegal. Parties 1FG. Telecom subscribers sue government over tax and extension. INEC silent as PVC collection ends. And um, going towards the bottom of the front page there, overcrowded Abuja schools where pupils learn on bare floor. And that takes up most of the front page with the pictorial there depicting the children actually studying on 
their floors. FBI police hunt killers of Nigerian pastor's wife is another headline on the front page of the Punch newspaper and details of the story can be found on page 5. Now these are the major stories on the front page of the Punch newspaper this morning. All right, let's take a look at this day newspaper. From the top of the page there, interim government perish the thought. An NPC says 64.3 million liters of petrol released daily. And uh, just below the mast there, Aluko says uh, Oshun has taught INEC to transmit accreditation poll results simultaneously. APC PCC, Asorok Kabal wants a pliable successor to Buhari Achiku. Tinubu has history of appropriating public assets. Uh, we also have uh, the big story on Naira scarcity. Peter Obi calls for calm appeals to Nigerians to bear with federal government and CBN. Uh, we have writers here that says urges Apex Bank to expedite circulation of new currencies. UBA GMD says CBN banks addressing challenges associated with new Naira disbursement. Atiku alleges APC conniving with banks to hoard new 1,500 and 200 Naira notes. Police warn against lawlessness in Quara as governor calls for calm and man decries hiccups in implementation, says manufacturers will suffer a 25% drop in sales. And this pictorial, therefore, an award of quality and timely service delivery where the national uh, coordinator, chief executive officers of Servicom, Nen Mrs. Nenna Akajamili, presents an award to chief executive of NUPRC, Engineer Gwenga Komolafe. And uh, these are some of the stories on this day. Next, we'll take a look at the Guardian newspaper, the major story on the front page. Fuel, Naira scarcity depletes productivity, worsens inflation. And a host of riders here that says ASCSN, more workers to sit at home over intolerable fares. And not producing will lead to food shortage and retrenchment. That is according to the food union. Economy has disenfranchised MSMEs and we are starving, Nigerians lament. Still talking about the riders to the major story, protests playing into the hands of those seeking election shift. That comes according to the NLC president. And government making mockery of monetary system, says NECA. House may reconvene before February 25th elections over cash crunch, says Bajak Biamila. And Falun activists warn of social unrest. And finally, Afeni Fere, Buhari's seven-day request to resolve currency crisis too long. Now, these are the riders supporting the major story on the front page of The Guardian, which talks about fuel, narrow scarcity, depletes productivity, and worsens inflation. Still looking at the front page of The Guardian, Atiku tasks CBN on narrow availability, warns against bullion ban tendencies. Details can be found on page three. And still talking about Atiku, a story here that says IPOB alleges plan to attack Atiku in southeast. And details of that can be found on page seven. Towards the top of the front page is a story, 20 million naira to treat cancer case, 1 million for radiotherapy. And that is on page six of The Guardian. To politics now, APC divided, ignore LFI's outburst at your perils, ex-aspirant warns party leadership, and that is on page three. Now, these are the major stories on the front page of the Guardian newspaper. All right, let's look at Daily Sun. Uh, just beside the nameplates there, anxiety in APC over Tinubu's Cold War with Buhari. He'll win despite gaffes, attacks on president, says PCC. Now, Naira redesigns senseless, says Oshomole. Details on page 27. The lead story here says tension heightens over new Naira notes, fuel scarcity. Lagos, Ibadan, Abuja, Port Harcourt was hit. Nigerians groan, businesses count losses. Military, police, security agencies on red alert. And uh, there's a pictorial there of Chairman, Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, assisting in checking names of electorates during mock accreditation of at Area 10 Center in Abuja at the weekend. Uh, below that pictorial, scarcity to worsen as Ipman warns members not to buy petrol above 195 naira per litre. And on the footnote there, we have beware of plot to derail electoral process. Northern elders tell Buhari details on page 27. More stories on the front page of Daily, Tra uh, Daily Sun, I beg your pardon. 
Arthur Eze backs federal government CBN on narrow redesign cashless policy. PDP will ensure Southeast inclusion, says Okowa, accuses APC of promoting disunity and trust. On census, NPC reassures on conduct of credible, acceptable, acceptable headcount. Details on page 6. PDP commends Atiku for standing with for Nigerians, alleges APC Tinobu mopping up cash for vote buy-in, and uh, meet the CEO foundational conditions responsible for poverty in Nigeria, says Envoy. And these are some of the stories on Daily Sun. Next, we'll take a look at the Nigerian Tribune and the major story: currency swap. Reps may reconvene before elections if current hardship continues. That is according to the speaker. And our writers here says Tinubu stands with Nigerians. PDP wants CBN to monitor distribution and provide mobile banks in rural areas. Accuses APC of mopping up new notes for polls. And we won't join issues with PDP. That's according to the APC PCC. And banks not hoarding new narrow notes. And that is according to bankers. Details can be found on page 7. Looking at other stories on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune, death toll in Katana killings rises to 84. Buhari condemns attacks. That is on page 27. Don't plunge Nigeria into anarchy, Yakase warns election rigors. And suspected herdsmen kill six farmers, traders in Ondo community. That is also on page 27 of the Nigerian Tribune. Fashola's account of Ladoja's impeachment saga false. That is according to ex oil speaker Adeleke. Still talking politics, Tinubu versus Atiku, North in Focus is another story on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune, and it comes with riders. Doubts over Tinubu's acceptance persists. G5 stiff with Atiku preventing timely decisions, and Tinubu has a history of appropriating public assets, and that is an allegation by Atiku. Details of that story can be found on page 3. Going towards the top of the front page there, Awolowo Dosumu, Osita Ogbu join IGE. T advisory board and scarcity of fuel, new narrow notes, elections, security on the alert. And that uh, comes with a rider here that says politicians, groups under security watch, port land borders to be monitored. And the details of that can be found on page 25. Now, these are the major stories on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. All right, let's take a look at business day uh, this morning. Uh, from the top of the page, there we have Emerging Market Rally Eludes Nigerian Stocks Naira. And then uh, there is a pictorial beside that story of students of University of Benin. Uh, block, who, uh, they actually blocked the Benin-Lagos Expressway over alleged oppression by military personnel in Benin City on Friday. And uh, just below the nameplates there, or the lead story, talks about pension under pressure from incessant exit demands. And then uh, we have um, more stories. New Naira notes, scarce in banks, abundant at parties. Uh, construction business slows on a new Naira policy, and banks insist on no cash after CBN's directive. And we also have trapped funds. Nigerian travel agent lose 500, um, agents lose $500 million in one year, says Nanta. And these are some of the stories on Business Day newspaper. All right, and uh, I think with that, we'll go on a quick break. And when we return, we'll take a look at some of these stories. But the situation where you find that they look like the it's not necessarily uh, tribal or regional.
not necessarily uh, tribal or regional. Welcome back. And now we'll start by taking a look at some of the stories on Daily Trust newspaper. And the lead story here uh, talks about bandits' attacks and how 71 have been buried in Katsina communities. And uh, more are still missing. 27 women kidnapped. And uh, a lot of locals have actually left their uh, communities due to these attacks. And, uh, uh, you know, the president and uh, presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar also condemned the attack. You'd actually take a look at the infograph there. Uh, it talks about, you know, what is happening in these communities and the number of uh, communities and the affected communities all in Bakori local government area. It's actually really sad to know that despite, you know, enormous efforts, you know, at uh, tackling uh, these bandits attacks, even with the redesign of the new Nara notes, that these attacks are still ongoing. Well, the numbers are quite alarming uh, yeah. when you look at it. And um, despite the fact that um, pre prior to this, there was, a, there was a bit of a lull when it came to the activities of these bandits and came to the attacks, but they just came back with, uh, with, with full force. And of course, uh, a lot of people, I mean, like 71 people buried uh, at one particular time. I mean, like, it's a huge loss. It it's, it's a huge loss. Okay. And it, 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 uh, it's not something that you'd actually want to see occur on a regular basis. And I, I do hope that these uh, these people or these bandits will actually be stopped, so that these attacks can can actually be be curbed, and um, the people there can actually go back to living their lives because because they have not been living their lives for a very long time. Mm. Most of them have relocated. A lot of lots of them have lost their lives. They've lost breadwinners. They've lost family members and loved ones uh, as well. And we're even hearing that um, 27 women were kidnapped mm. during the last attack. I mean, it's. It, the, the numbers are really, really alarming. Yes, and we indeed. just hope that the security agencies can be able to do something about it. And the sad thing is, uh, this is actually not just happening in the north. Because mm. if, you check, if, you, if, you, if you look at page 6 of Daily Trust, you find another story of uh, six being killed and property even raised as mm. gunmen attack Ondo villages, even despite the traditional rulers intervening on you know, some of the challenges happening in Nigeria. Yeah, well, the security situation is, is, is across the country. I mean, like, uh, um, everywhere you go, the facing one security challenge or the other and um, I, the security agencies are doing their best they're doing what they can and um, for a very long time we saw uh, a, a dip in in these cases mm. yeah but they seem to be resurfacing here and there and I think it's time for the security agencies to actually sit up again and see if they can be able to, uh, to we're, we're heading into an election we're just a couple of days to the election and I mean people need to feel safe to go out and vote because if I don't feel that my safety is guaranteed okay. most likely people well, a lot of people will not go out and vote, and that will affect the numbers, and at the end of the day, affect the outcome. Especially in mm. communities that have already been threatened. Exactly, in the, in the first place, mm. exactly, because some people have actually uh, actually living with that palpable fear that they will not be, uh, their security will not be guaranteed when they come out to vote. So I think that is something that we really need to look at, especially now as we're heading towards the general election. All right, now there's uh, on in depth, so that's on page three of uh, Daily Trust. Uh, uh, there's uh, this uh, King Simadu Ike, Nigerian Research Coordinator for Global Initiative Against Tran Transnational Organized Crime, has actually said that uh, tackling cattle rustling can check Nigeria's insecurity and boost uh, the economy. Do you agree with this? Well, cattle rustling, it can be the, the, the genesis of most of the bandit activities in, uh, in the north can actually be traced to cattle rustling. Most of the things that actually they started, most of these bandits started as people trying to they tried to take revenge or appraisal attacks because of their cattle that were actually rustled in the first place. So really, if you look at the, if you look at if you examine these things, you see cattle rustling is actually at the at the, at the bottom of it. It's, a, it's the root of the issue. Mm. So I think if we can if we go. I don't know whether or not it will have the kind of effect that it would have had if it had been done prior to all this, because right now the problem has snowballed into something else, and I think it's gone beyond cattle rustling. I think a lot of these bandits take it to be a business now, yeah, and they're actually, yeah, mm -hmm. and they, they're actually uh, in, in it for, for, for the long haul. So I don't think it might have the kind of effect that it might have if it had been done previously, prior to all of this, but it will go a long way. At least uh, those herders that are in um, uh, the doing 
the legitimate businesses can have their, their, their cattle safe. Okay. All right, so uh, let's take a look at, uh, you know, this particular story on airlines blocked funds. And, you know, quite an alarming number of people have actually lost their job. More than 721,000 people have lost their jobs. Even travel agents, you know, are actually, you know, scared over the $500 million, you know, trapped funds. Uh, the aviation sector seems to be slowly going down the drain. You know, a lot seems to be, you know, uh, happening in Nigeria. A lot seems to not be working in Nigeria. Well, I was speaking to someone earlier about this, and um, he was like, uh, uh, "What does he care? I mean, like, he doesn't travel. He doesn't. He doesn't board wow. planes. So it's only for that's a rich people problem. But that just puts into context what you've just brought up right now. I mean, there, there's a value chain when it comes to the aviation mm. sector, like any other sector. There's there's a value chain that comes with it. There are people that actually work within this sector. Mm. If the sector is not working the way it's supposed to be, then there are lots of people who are going to suffer. Their families are going to go into distress. The number of people that lost their jobs because of what is going on in the aviation sector right now, it's alarming. And these are the ones that actually are directly affected. We're not talking about yeah. the ones that are indirectly mm -hmm. affected because all their family members are affected. Anybody that is a benefactor that is benefiting from that particular person has lost something and he's affected as well. One person can actually be a benefactor to 10 or more people. All those people have been affected when you look at it. So it's not a question of saying that this is a rich person problem because it's only rich people to travel, but it has the, the entire value chain has been affected. And if this goes on like this, then the aviation sector will go down the toilet and we will not be able to salvage it. And a lot of things will go wrong. A lot of people will lose their jobs, making an even difficult situation more difficult. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a lot going on in politics as well, you know, from the APC to the PDP Labour Party. We can't really, you know, uh, talk about everything happening. But then one thing that struck, or one story that actually struck on inside politics is about uh, how um, uh, CDD uh, wants uh, lapses in mock accreditation addressed, saying beavers will eliminate identity theft. This is attributed to INEC. But a lot of people don't seem to, you know, have 100% trust in the beavers and if, you know, the elections will be free and fair. Well, actually, any piece of equipment, any piece of technology is only as good as the person operating it. People might not um, have a problem with the PIVAS particularly, but they might have a problem with the people operating it. How competent are those people? Do they actually have the capacity to do that? Mm -hmm. And what is the potential of those people, the, the, the probability of they, me, them being compromised? That is what people are afraid of. They're not actually afraid of the technology, they're afraid of how it's been deployed and who mm -hmm. is deploying it. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is, I think, one aspect that hasn't been looked at, even by INEC it, mm -hmm. uh, itself. I think it's playing, placing more emphasis on the machines, on how, it's, how it can be able to work, its workability, how they can be able to put it in place to, for, for the elections. We're not talking about the personnel. We're not looking at those personnel. What are we doing to make sure that these guys are not compromised? Background checks. Exactly. Background. What are we doing to make sure that these guys actually even, they have the capacity to operate this machinery. If they do, what is the probability of them being compromised? Because they can be, and they can be able to manipulate these things because it, as I said earlier, it is only as good as the person operating it. So I think it's something that we really need to look at, and it, we're not giving it much attention, as much attention as we as we want it. Of course, the BVAS can be used as a tool to stop election rigging, to be able to make sure that elections are credible, to ensure fairness when it comes to the system. But what about the people? Mm -hmm. Definitely, people have to operate them, and those are the people that we need to work on. All right, let's take a look at City and Crime page on uh, pages 28 and 29. We have gunmen kidnap Abuja chief's wife, sons, five others, and demand 35 million naira and food stuff as well. And uh, we also have NRC suspends officials over Abuja Kaduna derailment. Uh, there's a story on woman, teacher, others detained over two tons of drugs. Ritualist arrested with human skull in Niger. Three killed as building collapses in River State. You know, uh, recently was that one, the one in Abuja, and then we have one in River State. Uh, POS operators buy new Naira notes from filling stations in Niger. Mm. I don't even understand how that works, but then uh, we have uh, two masquerades napped over attack on Lagos community. And uh, a lot seems to be happening in o Ogun State as well as man arrest is arrested for setting wife ablaze 
in Ogun, and a brother shoots his sister's boyfriend in Ogun State as well. Mm. You know, a uh, really, really sad one there. These are some of the happenings uh, on city and crime. Yeah, you, you, you know, you, you, you realize that there's actually trouble when you have a newspaper dedicating uh, two pages to whatever the crime, crime happening, mm. every, uh, happening everywhere and we can see that by the nature of these stories I mean like we have issues of fraud you have issues of murder you have issues of assault attempted murder racketeering all these things are happening in different parts of the country in different sectors and it cuts across everybody it's not that just it's a particular um, group of people that are but it's crime is just crime Mm. It's not ascribed to anybody. Nobody has a monopoly over it, and, and that is how it is. And fortunately, what should I say? Our, our security agencies are doing their best because we've seen some of those stories that people were arrested and people are being prosecuted, investigations being carried out, and the rest of it. Yes, more needs to be done if there's a need because things are still spiraling out of control, but they're not way out of control that we cannot be able to bring them down. And I think our security agencies should sit up a little bit um, to be able to take off these challenges. Not that they're not doing a good job. Most of them are doing a fantastic job mm -hmm. and we can see the results um, elsewhere. Just a little more needs to be done. Okay, so quickly, uh, one more before we wrap up this particular segment. Uh, the Guardian lead story talks about fuel, Naira scarcity depletes productivity and worsens inflation. Even the punch carried you know, this as its lead story, uh, saying Buhari is under pressure to end fuel and Naira disasters. Now, the whole idea, uh, one benefit of the Naira redesign is to end inflation. Is this, uh, whatever is happening now, are we seeing uh, a storm before the calm? Because you go to some some uh, communities in or some markets in in the north and they're actually selling at a loss already because there's naira scarcity you know uh, i actually got to experience it during the weekend i couldn't actually buy fuel because i didn't have cash and then you go to the filling stations you want to buy uh, fuel but you have to queue to pay before you even buy you don't even queue with your cars anymore you queue with your card to pay and make sure that the transaction goes through before you're able to buy fuel. Mm, so I'm, 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 not a, I'm not an economy expert or, or, or a money person, but mm -hmm. I can only attest to the, the current crunch that's, that's going on right now. If you have a situation whereby you go to the POS and you want to withdraw cash and they're telling you that if you want to withdraw 10,000 Naira, they don't you, have even to have the cash. you have to give them 3,000 for those mm. who have it. Mm. You know, for every 10,000, you have to give 3,000 Naira. I mean, it's appalling. It is. No matter what it is, um, this Naira redesign policy, whatever the end game is, whatever it is trying to achieve, at the present situation, people are not finding it funny. That is just the basic thing. You have money in the bank, you can't access it, you can't spend it. A couple of days ago, people tried doing transfers, transfers were not and going through. Were people were actually being debited, money was not credited to where it was supposed to go. Some apps refused to even open because we don't have the infrastructure to do this. Are we ready for it? Probably not. We probably need a little more, more time, time before we can be able to say we can go cashless. Going cashless is fantastic. It's absolutely phenomenal because there's nothing as good as you going to pay for goods and services with your card or sending an electronic transfer. You don't have to carry cash around. You understand? That is absolutely fantastic. But in a situation whereby the infrastructure is not there, the banks are not ready to go cashless because they are the ones who actually they're the ones who develop these apps and look after them. And then you have a situation whereby you go to somewhere, you're probably in an emergency situation or something like and that. You, you want pay. to make, and you can't. You can't make an electronic payment because the bank application is down. So these are the kind of issues that we need to look at before we can be able to talk about going cashless. You just hope that this and if this money is going to get, be made available, let it be made available. That we can go back to the drawing board, make sure the infrastructure is in place mm. before we can actually launch and go into the, this thing the way we are supposed to do it. All right. Well, uh, I think uh, with that, uh, we've uh, come to the end of the newspaper review. And I will take a quick breather now. When we return at the top of the hour, the show continues. Stay with us.
Now, as part of efforts to support Africa's goal of strengthening. Now, looking at the activity chart, as you can see right here, a total volume of more than 30. It returned a Boko Haram crisis that at that time was restricted to Yobe. How secure are they? You can see security men with blood. This is the road leading up to the. For leading, if you look at England's squad, you are looking at EPL, you are looking at their names. You are not looking at. Uh, good morning and thank you for staying with us. It is Daybreak uh, on Trust TV and we're live by the Federal Capital Territory. I'm Dashan Husseina Usman. Thank you for uh, staying with us once again. It is 8 a.m. top of the hour. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Welcome once again to Daybreak and if you've uh, been with us all this while then welcome back. All right, let's take a look at the highlights at this hour. Jigawa Governor names new Emir of Dute. And 228.1 billion budget. Serap sues Lawan Bajagbia Mila over NAS spending. 2023 Davis Cup. Great Britain rich finals as Cameron Nori seals victory. And now to the details. Governor Mohammed Badaru Abubakar has approved the appointment of Mohammed Hamim as the new Emir of Dusi. He succeeds Nuhu Mohammed Sunusi, who died in an Abuja hospital last week. A statement from the Emirate Council said the name of the new Emir was forwarded to Jigawa State Council of Chiefs, which also approved the decision of the Kingmakers, but sent names of the other two contestants to the Governor for his approval. Due to Emirate Kingmakers had unanimously selected the new Emir among the three contenders for the royal seat. All right, moving on. The Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, Sarab, has filed a lawsuit against the Senate President Ahmed Loeng and Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Miller, over the National Assembly's budget. 
Sarap Deputy Director Kola Waleo Luadare disclosed this in a statement on Sunday, saying the suit became necessary following their failure to cut the unlawful National Assembly budget of 228.1 billion naira, including the 30.17 billion naira severance payments and inauguration costs for members. In the suit, defendants are President Muhammad Buhari, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, SAN, and the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed. He stated that the suit followed the move by the National Assembly to increase its 2023 budget from 169 billion naira proposed by President Muhammad Buhari to 228.1 billion naira. While the approved budget shows an increase of about 59.1 billion naira, the country's budget of 21.83 trillion naira is based on a 10.49 trillion naira revenue and an 11.34 trillion naira deficit. Now, the rights group wants an order restraining and stopping Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning Zainab Ahmed from releasing the National Assembly. Uh, to the National Assembly, the budget of 228.1 billion naira until an impact assessment of the spending on access to public goods and services and the country's debt crisis is carried out. Now to sports and specifically tennis. Cameron Norrie has sealed Great Britain's place in the Davis Cup finals group stage as his victory over Colombia's Nicolas Mejia gave the visitors an unassailable 3-1 lead in Bogota. The British number one made it back-to-back -back straight sets wins at altitude on clay as he beat Mejia 6-4, 6-4. It meant Dan Evans was not required to play a final winner takes all rubber against Nicolas Barrientos. Okay, and with that, uh, we wrap up the highlights at this hour and we'll move on to more stories. Now, with just about three weeks until the presidential election, Benway youths are worried that the rising cost of transportation in the country may affect voter turnout. Now, Jimmy Adzande, who spoke to some Nigerians in the state, says there is an air of apprehension in some quarters due to fears of disenfranchisement caused by cost of transportation. The report. The streets in some areas of Makudi and Benue as a whole are becoming empty even in highly populated areas due to the rising cost of transportation. Both intra and intercity shuttles have become nearly impossible for most residents of Benue State. While some are resorting to walking, others cannot due to health challenges. Today, people tend to actually take advantage of situations, most especially in the business world, because if you look at, yes, don't doubt about the fact that the price of fuel today is high and at some point even to get it has become a problem. But then you discover that people in the business world um, tend to make, take advantage of this situation. The residents added that if something is not done fast, the hike in transportation would affect the 2023 post negatively. They said, coupled with other challenges, most people cannot afford to travel out to participate in the elections, even when they are willing. High cost of price to transport themselves back to their virus places, like students from Inugu, Benin, Delta, who are in Benue State, cannot afford such amount to travel back to their states for the general election. And as well, students who are indigenous of Benue State and who are in other states studying, cannot afford such amounts to travel back to the state for the general elections. They urge the authorities to intervene and swiftly too to reduce the hardship on Nigeria. The price of petrol is the cost of the high prices in transportation and of such if the government can please bring down the price of petrol like right now in some states a pet petrol is sold, is sold at 350 naira per litre, some 600 per litre. If this is not done, I am telling you, the population that will participate in the election will be like, will, it will be a disgrace. The population will be low. I am pleading with the government officials to please intervene. There has been tears of agony in the past weeks due to the Naira crisis and the fuel hike who just said have made the situation worse. They are hopeful that the situation does not lead to voter apathy in the coming polls.
And uh, moving on now, with um, just about um, talking about the elections at uh, the moment, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, is confident that whatever challenges experienced during the mock accreditation with the bimodal voters accreditation system machines will be fixed before the election. Now, the National, INEC National Commissioner in charge of Kaduna, the FCT, Nasarawa and Plateau States, Mohammed Haruna, gave the assurance at the Rigachukum polling unit in Kaduna. Let's take a look. The mock accreditation exercise at Tudungwada Rigachukum polling unit 13 recorded attendance of three voters. Idris Al Hassan was the first to be accredited. He described the process as less cumbersome and hoped it will be maintained during the election. I came early. I'm the first person that has been credited. Actually, very, very, very easier to accredite everybody that came. INEC, electoral officers in charge of Igabi local government area, Fatima Garba, noted that. If the tempo of the accreditation is sustained, large number of voters can be accredited within a short time. So if this, if we keep up at this pace, we hope that even if with the large number of registrants that were expected during the uh, elections, with the way the um, uh, machine, of course, operated today, with what we what with what uh, with what was witnessed today, we are hopeful that if we go at this pace, uh, we will be able to accredit as many voters as possible. One issue that came up during the mock accreditation exercise in this polling unit was the refusal of the Beavers machine to accredit one of an identical twins because of the facial features. Uh, but, but there's enough time, three weeks, so we'll be able to sort it out. And as you can see, it's very, as uh, the admin, the, uh, admin, admin sex said here, it's very it's isolated. Those that have been known here, only one had that. And even that, they were able to do it because they used the facial when they couldn't use the, you know, the fingerprint when they could. If what is witnessed here at the mock accreditation is anything to go by, the process is by far an improvement on the card reader. However, many hope no hitch would be recorded during the elections. Bella Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. All right, thank you so much for staying with us. Now, right about now, we'll move on to our first discussion. And today we'll be talking about uh, cancer. Cancer is a disease that occurs when changes happen in a group of normal cells within the body, leading to uncontrolled abnormal growth and forming a lump called a tumor. A survey report by the International Agency for Research on Cancer has shown that just 33 days into 2023, Nigeria has recorded over 10,000 new cancer cases and 7,000 deaths. Now, the World Cancer Day was marked two days ago, that's on February 4th, uh, to raise awareness of cancer and to encourage its prevention, detection and treatment. Now, in the studio, we have a medical doctor and a family health physician, uh, Dr. Agbo Ebuta, and he's in the studio to share his thoughts on cancer management and prevention. Good morning and thank you for joining us on Daybreak. Good morning and thank you for having me and you're welcome Nigerians. <laughs> All right, so uh, how will you rate uh, the level of cancer awareness in Nigeria? Um, one word, low. Okay. And um, I mean that shouldn't be surprising because um, if you look at cancer, as a whole, and you contextualize it about, on, or you try to contextualize it against what's happening globally, mm -hmm. you realize that as much as um, um, most of the burden for cancer, new cancer cases, dead from cancer cases, are going to occur in low and middle income countries. If we were to use uh, estimates and extrapolations, we probably globally may have mm -hmm as much as uh, 17 or so million new cases of cancer uh, yearly and as much as uh, 10 million of those patients who are diagnosed with cancer or extrapolated to have cancer will die, unfortunately. More than 60 to 65% of these people 
would die in low and middle income countries and most of them would be in Africa. And we know that the African population of 1.4 billion with one in every five uh, black man or uh, African resident being a Nigerian. Nigerian would also take a significant uh, percentage. And in your opening statement, you clearly pointed out that uh, as much as 10,000 uh, new cases mm -hmm. of cancers mm -hmm. have so far occurred mm. in 33 days. Mm. And if you multiply 33 days, you say, okay, you average it to 30, and you say you are talking of what, uh, one year. That is clearly an estimated projection of mm. about 120,000 new cases. If you extrapolate that much further, and you say that you have 7,000 deaths per month, and you multiply 7,000 deaths, that would be about... 84,000 deaths expected oh. this year. That is totally, I mean, totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Again, it is because we have other indices, apart from being in low and middle income countries, we have health system challenges. Mm -hmm. And these health system challenges conspire mm -hmm. to ensure that the progress in cancer care in the country and management and prevention is uh, adversely affected. Mm -hmm. That is why the theme for this year's cancer care is basically about what? Closing the gap. Mm. And where is this gap, globally speaking? It's in low and middle income countries. All right, so that's in terms of, um, I think, cancer care generally you're talking about. But yeah. I, there's one area I want to focus on. Mm. Most cancer cases um, uh, are, discovered, are discovered very late, diagnosed very late. By the time that someone has, has a cancer diagnosis, it's already too far down the line and we're talking about palliative Absolutely. care. Isn't there a way we can be able to like, speed up the process or make it easier for people to actually get screened for cancer? I, I know there are, there are tons of cancers out there. And is, is there one blanket way that you can be able to check for all of them? Unfortunately, there are over 200 cancers. Mm. As you pointed mm. out, each of these cancers require unique way of classifying and identifying them. And even within the subgroups of the different cancers, mm. some of them for you to definitely establish a clinically viable diagnosis, you have to subclassify your diagnostic measures. Mm. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, um, the situation is not going to significantly change, except we are able to adjust some of our, globe, our health indices. Let me throw this. For example, out-of-pocket spending for healthcare in Nigeria is roughly put at about 70%, meaning that 70% of the Nigerian population wait to get ill, and when mm. they get to the hospital, they have to cough out that money, mm. and that money is not there. I mean, uh, um, um, uh, what's the, the income baseline? It's about 30,000 naira. Treatment of cancer, diagnosis of cancer, screening for cancer runs into hundreds of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, the Guardian newspaper actually carried it today, saying 20 million to treat cancer case and 1 million for radiotherapy. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is close to it. Close to it. Um, but these are rough estimates. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you have people who need more than 20 million. You have people who need less than 20 million. Mm -hmm. But that figure is a significant average that may state, say, what the, how, how, how challenging the situation is. Mm -hmm. Apart from the, the out-of-pocket spending, the, the number of uh, people who spend, who pay for health from out-of-pocket, uh, and they pay for mainly acute conditions. So when you are trying to pay for malaria, you are trying to pay for typhoid, you are trying to pay for hypertension, you are trying to pay for diabetes, you sometimes you may not have the finance mm. to go and pay for a screening test, for example. If we were to screen for, for, for colorectal cancers, it's a bit, a bit expensive. Much cheaper screenings are things like maybe for HIV, uh, which may link to cancer, yes, and then screening for hepatitis, which may be connected to cancer, screening for H. pylori, which may be connected to cancer, and screening for uh, some other conditions like, uh, which are a bit esoteric, Epstein-Barr mm. virus and the rest. So screening is not in our character in terms of when it comes to even our health beliefs. We, yeah. do not, we, we are not interested in it. It's, we will simply say it is not my portion. No, but the yeah. thing is, mm. even, even if um, we, we want to screen, what do we screen?
screen for? You just said that there are over yes. 200, 200 of these. Okay. Good. So, so, so that's the idea. If you are going to screen, you are, you are going to screen for the more common. The usual suspects. Yes. In as much as the list of long list of 200, there are a few that, for example, 50% of cancers occurring in Nigeria occur uh, between uh, linked to either breast or cervical cancer. Mm. So if we are going to screen and prevent this, we can cut the burden by 50%. You can imagine that. And these are conditions, these are things that, I mean, uh, when you talk of breast cancer screening, this is something that people can do in their showers when they are taking their baths. Mm. They do it at uh, the end of the menses and they do it probably every month. And then every year they go and when they see their doctors, they get a proper clinical, you get evaluation. And if they can afford it once a year, once they are above 40 to 50, depending on their risk factors, they get a mammogram. So all these are a bit, you know, you need to have the framework and the structure in place. What is insurance penetration in Nigeria? Less than 5%, mm. meaning that most people are not covered. Even the people that are covered for insurance, covered by insurance in Nigeria, are not necessarily covered for cancer screening and cancer treatment. So we need to be able to the Nigerian Cancer Control Plan of uh, 2018 to 2022 was very, very robust, like most of our plans are. But it took a couple of months to years for it to even be implemented. And even implemented was, implementation was bogged down by many health system challenges. Finance, for example, was a big issue. What do we spend on health? How do you measure health financing for countries? In, 20, in 2001, there was something called the Abuja Declaration. I think we're conversant with that. The Abuja Declaration, a couple of head of states met in this Abuja in 2001, rather, and decided that your total contribution, the, your total, the percentage of your gross budget, which will be allocated specifically to health, will be 15%. Now, only South Africa is probably, was probably doing 12% as a point and one or two countries. In Africa, for example, most countries were doing less than 5%, 6%. Nigeria consistently performed at 5% until recently where we spiked up to 6%, but even that was less than optimal. And let me just, for example, if you look at spending for health and spending for cancer, you know that we are, we, are, we, are, we are significantly behind. The United States, for example, spent $200 billion on cancer care, treatment, diagnosis, and all of that in, uh, in, in not too long ago. $200 billion at the current exchange rate will probably be about 150 trillion naira. Mm. Now, 150 trillion naira is seven times our national budget. So even if we were to take all of our national budget to fund cancer care, it still we would not be there. Hmm. But be that as it may, even our current national budget, we are underperforming in terms of allocation toward health care. And that is generally trickling down to cancer because where malaria and other health conditions are priority, cancer, which is, uh, I mean, a condition that you need to diagnose and you need to follow up, and it's basically a chronic condition, mm. and more often than not, leads to death, All right. takes the back seat. Now, earlier we actually talked about, you know, 10,000 new cases, but, you know, how can Nigeria actually manage more patients, you know, with the amount of brain drain happening at the moment? In fact, um, the issue of uh, human resource for health is one of the cornerstone pillars of health system management. The ratios are scary and it's of concern. Um, to manage a cancer case, what you need is a multidisciplinary team. Now, most of those multi members of the multi as you pointed, are being drained out of the system, out of the system. and to even, to even address specific cancers that require certain treatments like radiotherapy, you need a medical oncologist, you need a radio oncologist, you need a medical physicist, and you also what you need what a radiographer that is trained in radiotherapy. Now, some of these people are not even available. In, in medical oncologists, radio oncologists in Nigeria, oncologists generally in Nigeria, are probably less than 100. Mm. Now, if you contextualize that against a population of 120 million people, it means that you probably have one oncologist to 2.2 million mm -hmm. people. 
but the Nigerian health space cannot pay an oncologist, cannot compete in paying an oncologist at the global rate. So if you probably earn a couple of uh, hundreds of dollars here in Nigeria when you convert it, and you cross border to somewhere more lucrative, you may earn 10 times your salary mm. in one month compared to it will take you one whole year to earn one month of your salary. So there's a lot of competition. What can we do differently? Well, we need to start funding health. We need to start putting strategies in place that increase access to funding for health in a sustainable way. Mm. How, did, how uh, the, the last year, the president graciously signed uh, a Nigerian Health Insurance Authority Act 2022. This mandated that everybody, every Nigerian, will be covered by the insurance. This mandated that uh, a significant percentage, which came to about 83 million Nigerians who are considered vulnerable, will be covered by some uh, form of funding through the Nigerian Health Act and through special grants from global organizations which fund these kinds of things. So we need to have a larger pool. We need to get everybody, private sector people, we need to get the man on the street. We need to come up with disruptive innovations that ensures that the man on the street has access to some form of health insurance that increase the size of the, um, the pool and we can now deploy intelligently. Now, we cannot approach healthcare the way the West is approaching it. Like we pointed out, the US spends 200 billion, which is about seven times of our national budget only on cancer. So we cannot, we cannot use the same strategy. We need to emphasize on uh, prevention. Mm -hmm. We need to emphasize on early detection. And as you earlier pointed out, up to 80% of our cases of cancer present uh, at the late stage, which is stage. They have usually four stages of mm. cancer anyway, one, two, three, four. When you say three and four, that's late. One and two is considered early. Now, most of our patients present what? At stage three and four. Mm. And why is that? It happens because of many factors. Most Nigerians will take a convoluted pathway to healthcare. You are sick, you feel a lump in your chest, for example, or you feel something funny in your breast. You first reject it. You pray, you go to church on Sunday, you go to mocks, you see one or two people, you consult, you get... And some people will say it's what is the gene. Other people will say it's an, an attack infection. and all of that. Some will, Spiritual all, attack. And then even when Nigerians start to consult, some Nigerians start to consult. They start from their neighbors around their house, their uncles, their aunties, people who are supposed to have had an, a, a, a wider experience access to health and you don't blame them and what happens if that fails and they see that it's really getting bad where do they go to next they go to the chemist or the healthcare, uh, the, 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 the the pharmacist around mm. there and they say oh no you know they tell the person across the counter who may be a pharmacist or a health technician or just somebody who is smart at putting ideas together and marketing products and he says oh i have this swelling on my leg or i feel this rumbling in my tummy which could be anything or i have seen blood in my stool and which there could be colorectal cancer and you say it's pile or my eyes have gone green and they say and what happens the person packs a couple of drugs and say oh take this and you'll be fine and, and next thing Things don't get better, and they take another convoluted pathway to the primary healthcare center, which may be poorly staffed, poorly equipped, with, with minimum or no diagnostic capacity. And by the time they get to the what, uh, or even before they get to the to the grand hospital, of course they would consult their religious advisors, who would of course try to you know from the animist, from the traditionalist, to the other arms of the of the religious uh, space, who would try to come up with a theology with possible causes. If mm. you've had a quarrel, if you have a problem in your office mm. and you suddenly have a leg swelling, it's, I mean, the coincidence is too much. We are Africans. And we believe that this is what the situation is. So these are the issues. So we need to educate our people massively. We have over uh, 100 million lines. We have 100 million, over 100 million people accessing some form of internet access. We have Starlink in Nigeria now with 100% broadband. So technology is a means and a way to delivering information 
that would change the health okay. behavior of our Nigerians. Okay, I just need you to actually touch on this, you know, uh, very quickly. Uh, reports have actually shown that uh, women with breast cancer in Nigeria are relatively younger than, you know, uh, their counterparts in, you know, other climes. What is actually responsible for this pattern? Because I remember last year I actually lost, you know, a, a mm. friend, a very young, mm. you know, lady to breast cancer as well. Mm. Mm. Well, breast cancer has multiple etiologies, established and unestablished. Some of them are genetic-based etiologies. Now, for us to establish that, we need to do the significant uh, evaluation of the number of people who have that family history. Those who have family history have higher risk of developing cancer. And there's a gene called the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. And these are breast cancer, uh, they are, they are breast cancer promoting genes. Mm. And guess what? In fact, some people are even doing what you call prophylactic mastectomy. Mm. So they have a history of breast cancer in their family and they go and they do this expensive test to identify a gene and when they have the gene, they estimate their risk mm. and they get end up under the, the surgical bread and they take mm. out their breast. I mean, Angelina, Angelina Jolie mm. has yeah. done it and a lot of people are promoting the idea. So in terms of um, what the etiological factors, we can, it can, we can only make uh, intelligent guesses. What are uh, uh, our exercise lifestyle? Are we, are, we, are we living healthy lifestyle? In certain parts of the Niger Delta, where the, 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 the activities of uh, oil barons have ensured that the atmosphere is completely polluted with uh, sulfur, lead, uh, rain, and all of that. It means that cases of, we expect that cases of cancer is going to spike up because we know that hydrocarbon, uh, burning of hydrocarbon, exposure to smoke, both cigarette smoke and hydrocarbon smoke are contributing factors to what? cancer etiology. So this is a factor. Mm -hmm. And certain meals we eat, we eat all kinds of meals. Even the pomo we eat, some people have said that when you are preparing pomo, uh, it's put done unhygienically, it's burnt with tires and mm -hmm. all of that. That may introduce certain kinds of, you get uh, a carcinogenic agents to a large mm -hmm. extent. Okay. So it's multifactorial. We have not established it, but we do know the risk factors. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you so much. I actually wish we had more time to, you know, uh, talk more on uh, cancer. A very, very touchy uh, uh, topic there. But thank you so much, Doctor, for taking time out to enlighten us on, you know, uh, cancer awareness and more. Thank you. It's always a, a pleasure to come to Trust TV. You guys are doing a super job. Thank Thumbs you. up to you. And please keep up the good work. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right. So that was medical doctor and family health physician, Dr. Agbo. Uh, a buta in the studio discussing you know uh, cancer management and uh, prevention we'll take a quick break and we'll move on to the next discussion when we come back
welcome back. Now let's quickly move on to our um, second discussion on Daybreak this morning. Prices of grains in Adama have gone down owing to scarcity of Naira in the hands of buyers and traders. Now with this development, weekly markets in the state are wearing empty looks with low turnout of would-be buyers. Now Silas Loan visits some weekly markets and files in this report. It is not the usual busy market day for these traders as most of the market activities are at standstill due to non-availability of cash to transact business. Traders here are just counting losses almost on daily basis. A bag of maize that was sold between 20 and 22,000 naira last three weeks is now selling between 17,000 and 14,000 naira or even 12,000 naira depending on the transactions, transfer, cash of old or new currency. While some are not happy with the development, calling quick review of the policy. Others say it is a welcome development. When we talk of the cashless policy, actually it affects us much in the sense that when you go to remote area, when you have no cash, nobody will go for, will give you his own goods. So as a result of that, you will just come out with nothing. Because they are not accepting uh, transfer. And uh, most of the remote areas, not just they are not accepting it, they have no network. When, where you will even find network, the network is not very, very bad. I used to buy rice, soya beans and other grains with millions of naira before. But with this new policy, I hardly buy goods because of lack of cash. Our business requires cash. We are in serious trouble. For me, this policy is good, and it will never come at a better time than now. May Allah bless President Buhari for implementing the policy. We are now buying foodstuff at lower price. Transporters also have their own side of story as regard to challenges and new wave of hardship caused by the CBN Naira redesign and cashless policy. Passengers are so yana sonya tipi rishin change na da akache ayi change babu kudi akasa saka moko in akai transfer babu ne tu kumi kyo wanda zaka get transfer. This policy has brought actually nothing to us but on hold hardship. We don't like it. Our businesses are on standstill. If really they want our votes and peace of this country to continue, let them review the policy. Passengers will make a transfer. Kaike, kuma gidem mai suba su karban transfer sai cash. To gaskiya wannan canjin kudin da aka mana canjin makeri ne. They said we have to be cashless society. What have they put in place to achieve that? Some passengers will come here and suggest making transfer, but the network is not there. If you go to ATM for withdrawals, long queues, full stations, queues, I don't understand. Although Central Bank of Nigeria said the redesigned denominations of 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira notes, a new limit on the large withdrawals is aimed at Corbin money laundry, observers say the timing is wrong. From Yola, Silas Lowen, Trust TV News. As Gombe residents battles scarcity of the redesigned Naira notes, the Central Bank of Nigeria has met senior officials of, cent of commercial banks operating in Gombe State. Now speaking to newsmen, CBN Deputy Director of Financial Markets, Aliu Ashuru, said the meeting with commercial banks is to ensure smooth circulation of newly redesigned Naira notes across the state. Uru calls, uh, I think there has been some uh, changes to the guidelines of the implementation of the uh, policy. Uh, there is now an OTC transaction, OTC, I mean, over the counter payment of 20,000 Naira. Mm. So it's these modifications that we have called them, discussed with them, let them understand uh, the uh, process and then how it works. Uh, basically, uh, there is a ratio that we advise them to follow for all the cash that they have collected. Uh, a ratio of uh, 40, 30, 30, 
30-40% for payment through their agents, 30% for payment over the counter, and 30% to be loaded onto their ATM machine. Uh, we've come here so that uh, we will like, give the bank money, at least let, you know, uh, uh, let them not you know, stay over the weekend without having cash in their ATMs, one. And then secondly, we want them to pay the first customer at 8 a.m. tomorrow, uh, sorry, Monday when they open their businesses. Are there mm. sanctions for, to any bank over these new directives? Would there be sanctions? Would there be sanctions? Mm. Yeah. Sanctions. Natural, we, uh, naturally, there are sanctions and they come in many ways for any bank that flouts you know, the content of the guidelines that you have given. All right, so well, right now in the studio, we have uh, the manager, learning and development, Lux Terra Leadership Foundation, Mr. Henry Ijoma, and he is also a public affairs analyst joining us to share his thoughts on the lingering crisis. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on Good DB morning. This thank morning. you for having me. All right, good morning. All right, so um, my, my question is, a lot of people have said that, some people have said that this Naira redesign policy is good for the economy, it has long-term benefits and, and, and the rest of it. But we feel the crunch now and we see what people are going through and we are going through it as well. Those benefits that we are talking about, are they really worth this, what we're going through now? Yeah, I think in the long run, the benefits are, are huge for us okay. if we have an open mind to the change that uh, has been proposed. Uh, the hardships, no doubt, uh, we could see from all the images and from the experiences of people that many people are going through uh, a lot of stress. Mm. Uh, but I, I think that is something that is within the core of the issue. Okay. Because I think that the, the Naira note redesign has not been properly communicated to Nigerians. Uh, it's really not the end itself. It's only a means to achieving something more uh, important mm. and urgent. Uh, but people are seeing the Naira redesign as the end of it. Oh, so we have redesigned Naira, let's swap it. That's not the point. Uh, the CBN and the government is targeting to achieve something more. Mm. And there are two basic things that uh, the, the redesign leads to. First is to mop up money from uh, outside the banks, to get more money into the banking system. So the statistic is that the money outside the banking system is much more than what is within the banking system. And that is not good for security. That is not good for the economy. Then secondly, you want a change in culture, a huge change in culture on how people use money. Mm. So that in itself are the two major reasons why the redesign was. The redesign is the, uh, how do I call it, now? the launch pad to achieving those two major uh, objectives. Mm. So I think that the communication should actually change uh, to get people to understand what the aim is more than discussing just the, isn't the redesign. That late, isn't that yeah. too late in the game right now? Yeah, I think that's where the issue is mm. because, you know, for every change program, you need to communicate well enough to the people that they even desire the change because they understand it, you know. And because people, a lot of people have not understood it, they, they are resisting it. And they could see the hardship more than what it's, uh, it means for them. So they, are, they react based on the hardship they feel. Uh, and because of that, you get all these kind of uh, challenges. So a lot of people are rushing to go and queue because so I, I saw even the, the, most of the headlines. The word used is Naira swap, mm -hmm. currency swap. Cur is it really currency swap? No, it's not. Okay. We are not expected yeah. to swap like what we have. Move your money to the bank mm. and use alternative uh, methods to do transactions. Mm. Not as though the cash will not be available anyway, but the CBN wants the volume of cash that is available to be drastically reduced. Mm. So if I had a million naira in cash and I want to go to the bank to deposit one million, I should not be expecting to withdraw one million. That's the point. Mm. But a lot of people are expecting to do value for value, amount for amount. Okay, so you talked about, you know, uh, people rejecting the new Naira, you know, uh, redesign. But don't you think that if these, these new Naira notes were actually available and not scarce, that oh. these issues won't even occur in the first place? Okay, so, so that's the point again. Uh, there are two reasons why it is scarce. First is the deliberate effort by the regulator to ensure that what you have in circulation is not the same like it used to be. 
So, and that's where they're missing the mark because you communicate to people about the, the, the redesign and you speak about the redesign as though you are just changing the currency. You have just done the redesign as a means of attracting people to make the deposits. Mm. So actually what we should have been communicating to people will be to encourage people to return what they have to the bank, mm. right? Beyond that, of course, uh, a lot of people who had the initial opportunity to get most of the new notes, out of fear that uh, they don't want to have the old notes side by side, they keep all the new notes and continue to spend the old notes. So even individuals are hoarding what they have already collected. A lot of people are not spending what they have collected. So that's why the scarcity is even increasing. Mm. All right. And now, if we go by what you just said right now, that... Um the, the, it's a means to an end, yeah. this, this particular thing. And I believe a lot of people don't know that. Absolutely. Just like a lot of people don't know that it's, a ca it's not a cash swap thing. They want you to go and deposit your money into the bank so that the money can be in the banking system and you look for alternatives. So if we go by that, and we go by the fact that we need to find alternative ways of doing business, of transacting business, which is electronic, yeah. mostly. You do transfers, you use the POS, and, and the rest of it. That means we have a long way to go before we can think of starting things like Absolutely. this. Because right now, we don't even believe we have the infrastructure to do that. A couple of days ago, people were up in arms because you were sending transfers, the transfers were not going, monies were being deducted, they were not coming back. You go to the POS, you, uh, uh, transactions are being declined. You have money, but you can't use it. So are we really ready for this? Well, uh, there's enough blame in the basket to go around mm -hmm. every stakeholder. Uh, but CBN being in the middle of this mm -hmm. has uh, a lot more to take. Uh, the cashless policy had started for many, many years. Actually, I was still working in the bank when the cashless policy started. I had left the banking system for five years. But the cashless policy had not successfully permitted to all the nukes and crannies of Nigeria mm. because you left it within the urban cities and you did not have any program to ensure that you gradually moved it into the, the areas where cash transactions were really heavy. From the interviews we just uh, watched from your reporter, you see that some places they are still doing predominantly cash-based transactions. Those would have been the target of long-term conversation, long-term sensitization, so that the people move gradually into the new system. Mm. So I think that's where the real challenge is. The, the, the policy itself is not, uh, not so much of a bad thing, but the manner in which it has been implemented had led to many uh, uh, challenges and hardship that people are facing. So when I said that if you, if you are trying to bring a change in culture, the people need to know they need to understand it, and they need to desire it, so they look forward to it, because you need them. The policy is not for the CBN, it's for the people. Mm. You want people to use alternative means, so they should be well aware. And of course, the technological dimension is there. Uh, there are issues of bandwidth, whether the banks actually have enough bandwidth to sustain the surge, because we see that in the last one week, many people are complaining of using their bank apps and all that, because mm. actually, there was more traffic on those channels than they used to be in the last uh, one month or there about when people had continued to rely on the use of cash. Mm -hmm. So some of those issues are things that stakeholders would have continuously worked on gradually to ensure that you face into this as easily as possible. It, you know, when change comes and people don't suffer so much because of it, they tend to absorb it, they tend to welcome it more. So the resistance you see outside is because of the bottlenecks that have come with it. And I, and I say this, in, uh, with regards to many more policy changes that will happen, that we need to be a little more gradual, we need to be a little more sensitive to our environment, and ensure that the people understand what we are doing before we launch it. Okay, now, um, so, uh, compared to you know, what you've actually said and you know, uh, the objectives of these uh, Naira redesign, uh, some people seem to believe, or even some uh, reports and some newspapers have actually carried uh, uh, headlines on the fact that instead of making things better, you know, this redesign policy has actually worsened the economy and also the security challenges, you know, uh, facing the economy. Uh, well, there are, depending on where the arguments are coming from, uh, there are so many sides to this. Uh, the person who will say that it has worsened the has, security has situation inflation. may have their reasons, uh, but flip it a little it may have more positive implications for security than when we had so much cash. 
The banditry that we witnessed was because people had the opportunity to move cash as much as hundreds of million. Then you talk about inflation. The reason why there is inflation is, you know, inflation is high because there's so much cash chasing goods, as it were. But in truth, what we are considering to be the cash chasing the goods are not available for the people to spend. So we have been in a prolonged period of hardship. Inflation happens when there's so much money in circulation and people are chasing fewer goods. But in actual fact, in our circumstance in Nigeria, is that that cash that we assume to be outside chasing the goods actually st stacked somewhere are not being used. So you actually have few, it, it's a false inflation in some sense. So it has driven it up further now because it has affected the real persons who are supposed to supply goods. That's where the, the challenge you raise came from. So some of these persons in hinterlands who need to transport their goods from farms really may not be using POS, really may not be using uh, bank transfers. Some of those persons rely on cash. So their movement has somehow been hampered. So if you see this a surge in inflation in the last few weeks, it is because the real suppliers of goods have suffered the consequence of not having cash to do their business. And that is why some of those persons would have been an early target of the conversations, early target of the communication to ensure that they are well prepared to face the challenge that was coming. All right, so we've established that, um, just what you talked about right now, we've already established that, that um, uh, the, the job, the, the, uh, the ball was dropped when it comes to sensitization yeah. and giving the required information, especially to the public. And then we talked about the issue of bandwidth, having the right, um, uh, the, the capacity to deal with large volumes of transactions which were going on bank apps and the rest oh. of them. So if the CBN failed to sensitize the public properly on this, did they fail to sensitize the bankers as well? Were they not ready? Couldn't they see this coming? Because if we're going towards a cashless society, and we want to go cashless, definitely, you know, electronic transfers will be the next way to go. Couldn't they have done something about it if they saw it coming? Well, but from all indications, uh, I don't think the CBN actually did anything with the... With the uh, banks as with well? With the banks as well. It looked like everybody was informed about the same time. Hmm. You know, uh, maybe for some peculiar reasons, uh, okay. for security reasons and otherwise that we may not know, this discussion held between some very few individuals, very few stakeholders, mm. and the public and the banks obviously got that information at about the same time. Uh, there may be other peculiar things that the CBN is looking at that they want to forestall in, in, any, in any case, uh, that they decided to keep the information, to withhold the information until the time when they were ready. Mm. So they gave a little window of opportunity. Mm. You know, that may, I, I don't want to presume completely, but it may not be unconnected with the fact that there are lots of cash out there that are proceeds of criminal enterprise. Okay. And you may want that, that value that the people hold from, that they have gained from those criminal enterprise to become useless and worthless in mm. their hands. So that in itself could have informed that very short window of period for which that information was uh, made available. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So now um, we've seen the you know uh, redesign policy you know uh, marred by um, people selling the new naira notes. Uh. Uh, a, a particular lady was arrested in Lagos, and even POS operators have actually said that they go to the banks and they buy these new Naira notes. Uh, are there negative effects to you know buying or selling the new Naira notes? You see, currency, every currency is a national symbol and is supposed to be respected. If we isolate the case in point now where people are selling these redesigned Naira notes, we will be unfair to the public. Because, actually, Naira notes have been sold in this country regularly. You know, when you go to venues of parties in many cities, they sell, people hawk the Naira note. And that is something that should have been addressed long ago. So I don't see it coming it just, just because starts. of the redesign. Oh. It did not start now. Even in Abuja, along the express road around Dede and, uh, and the likes, sometimes you see people holding the new Naira notes in parks, waiting to sell it to those who are going for events and parties. So it's been, a, it's been a culture that had been in Nigeria, and we had not really addressed it. People need to know how to value national uh, uh, symbols, you know, and the Naira is one of it, including spraying it in parties. Mm. You know, a lot of people, so why do people look for those new notes? Because they want to spray it in parties. So what you are doing is that you, you take something that is new, that has been reprinted to ensure that it has, you know, some sort of, uh, uh, how do I call it now, prestige. 
you pick it and deface it almost immediately. Some people in churches and otherwise where they want to make offertory, you pick a new note that is clean straight and they squeeze it before they, mm. they drop it in the box. That's not the idea. So I think we need some level of reorientation to allow people to understand that this is a national value, this is a national, uh, is an item that represents our identity and we should give it some form of respect. Uh, and you know, because of the hardship as well, uh, people want to be innovative in some sense. Mm. And so everybody will want to cash out on the opportunities that has been presented to them, whether it is morally right or otherwise. Mm. Oh, all right, so just quickly before we go, um, you made a statement earlier that, uh, that caught my attention. You said there's enough blame to go around the stakeholders. Yeah. But, the, and, and, but most of it lies in, in, on the, in, on the, front, of, in the front of the CBN. Yeah. But for a very long time, the CBN has been pushing that particular blame towards commercial banks, saying that they have enough currencies, the banks are holding this, the banks are doing that. Mm -hmm. And we've seen um, some videos surfaced online of some banks actually had keeping these new narrow notes, not putting them in ATMs and the rest of it. Just uh, quickly, what do they stand to gain if they do hold these new narrow notes? Yeah, so that's about the politics of it. Mm. Uh, so, so I heard someone saying, and that's the right thing to say, that so when the CBN says that there's money in the banks, mm. how much volume? What's the volume you say is in the bank? Same volume as what you are mopping up from the, the banks? No. So they have does not mean that they have so much that they have enough to really go around. And that is why the, even with the introduction of the over-counter transfer, uh, uh, cash payment, the limit is very small. Because it's not like the banks have so much volume. And by the way, the CBN cannot just say that the banks have it, go to the banks. Because they receive daily report of cash positions of every bank daily reports. So even the statistics that they, they brandished to tell us that the funds, the cash outside the banking system was more than what is in the banking system is because they rely on the reports that they get from the banks. Mm. So and even now that the, the real cash swap is actually in CBN, when the commercial banks go to deposit the old notes, they are expected to withdraw the new notes from, from CBN. Mm. So you know the volume that you have paid out and they give you a report on a daily basis. Every bank will generate report of their cash position on a daily basis and they file it. So you know how much has been paid out and how much that they have. Okay. All right, well, uh, I think with that, we'll be wrapping up this discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Henry, for joining us uh, on this discussion this morning. Thank you so much. All right, so that was uh, Manager Learning and Development, Lux Terra Leadership Foundation, Mr. Henry Joma, and he's also a public affairs uh, analyst. Well, that we've come to the end of a daybreak on uh, Trust TV. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tomorrow is another day, and we'll be back again, same time, same station. I'm Dashan Husayna Usman. All right, it's been a wonderful time on Daybreak today. Why don't we do it all again tomorrow? I am Ibrahim Yusuf.